Hello, this is Mike Pelage, and you're listening to IP Fridays. Hello, and welcome to this episode of IP Fridays. Our names are Ken Suzanne and Rolf Clayson, and this is the podcast dedicated to intellectual property. It does not matter where you are from, in-house or private practice, novice or expert. We will help you stay up to date with current topics in the fields of trademarks, patents, design and copyright, discover useful tools, and much more. I'm Ken Suzanne, and this is IP Fridays, the podcast dedicated to intellectual property. Welcome to episode number 94. Today on IP Fridays, we're exploring blockchain and its intersection with intellectual property. From smart contracts to royalties to patents, we'll investigate how you can use this new digital tool. Before we discuss blockchain today, let's look at a developing global trend in trademarks. WIPO director Francis Geary has stated, The reality is a new competitor has arrived. That new competitor is China, or more specifically, China's intellectual property industry. 2017 was truly a record year for China. China has always been an IP heavy hitter. It held nearly 14 million trademarks at the end of 2017. But the rate of application for trademarks and patents has increased lately to truly staggering proportions. Take last year, for example. By all accounts, 2017 was a record year for Chinese trademark applications, with over 5.7 million applications filed. That's an increase of 36% to 55% in one year, according to some estimates. If those numbers are not jaw-dropping enough, let's put them into context. In 2017, China's trademark applications outpaced the United States 10 to 1. In mid-2017, that translated to more than 116,000 trademark applications filed in China per week. And patent applications increased as well. In 2016, China received more patent applications than the United States, Japan, South Korea, and the European Patent Office combined. It should not surprise you to learn that by some estimates, China could overtake the U.S. for patent applications in the next three years. China's economic growth may slow in the coming year, but even a 50% reduction in trademark application growth still makes China an intellectual property powerhouse. And you should keep your eye on the rest of Asia too. Japan was just behind China in patent applications last year. Now let's turn to the interview with Michael Pelage on blockchain. Blockchain, depending on who you ask, it's either revolutionary code launching a decentralized utopia or just a passing fad. Sure, there is money to be made in this field. According to Forbes, cryptocurrencies alone experienced a nearly 3,000% gain in 2017. But with the blockchain economy heating up so quickly, do you know how to ride the wave to success? Or will you buy into a bubble just before it pops? Joining me today is Michael Pelage, intellectual property attorney and IT consultant. Michael has been actively involved with ICANN since its creation 20 years ago. Michael, thanks for being a guest on IP Fridays. Well, thank you for having me. Michael, most of our listeners have heard the word blockchain before, but for someone who's completely new to the field, how would you describe this technology? Well, I think the starting point for any discussion about blockchain needs to start with a definitional level setting discussion. Um, and importantly, approximately 10 years ago, a white paper was written by an individual or a group of individuals under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto. And the title of this white paper was Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Now, while blockchain is the underlying technology that powers Bitcoin, the dominant cryptocurrency in, in today's market, the underlying technology has evolved. This is why I always try to focus my discussions on the broader term of distributed ledger technology that encompasses a much broader class of technology. Unfortunately, there are some people that tend to conflate all things blockchain with Bitcoin and the dark web. 
Okay, so Bitcoin and Ethereum are two popular cryptocurrencies uh, that myself and my listeners may have heard of. Uh, but where do they fit in on this Venn diagram of distributed ledger technology? Well, the Bitcoin and the Ethereum protocols fit neatly within the blockchain classification. There are some distinctions. Um, while Bitcoin is currently um, primarily just a cryptocurrency, Ethereum is much more diverse and uh, incorporates the use of an Ethereum virtual machine or EVM into the Ethereum protocol. And the EVM is an important feature set which powers the smart contract functionalities which some of your listeners may be familiar with in uh, reading or uh, doing some uh, uh, fundamental playing around with uh, blockchain technology. Yes, and so smart contracts is something that we want to take a deeper dive into a bit later. But before we do, Mike, uh, can you give us an example of a technology or protocol uh, that fits within the distributed ledger technology universe, uh, but which you would not categorize as blockchain technology per se? Sure. The, the best example I could uh, use that your listeners might have heard of is, is R3. Um, this is a consortium of fintech companies that were established in uh, 2014 to pursue blockchain technologies for the financial services community. Early on, R3 recognized that some of the open and public feature sets of the traditional blockchain protocol were inconsistent with the needs of the financial services community. This is why R3 developed the CORDA protocol, that's, uh, and they specifically did not call it blockchain technology, but instead referred to it as distributed ledger technology. I think as there continues to be an evolution of this technology, you will see further dele delineations within the broader DLT universe. Um, one other important point I'd like to make to your listeners, especially those in Europe. In U.S., blockchain remains the dominant terminology when discussing this technology. However, in Europe, you see a much greater use of the term distributed ledger technology or DLT. I personally believe that this trend can be attributed to a rebranding initiative to break away from some of the early stigmatism associated with Bitcoin, the Silk Road, and the dark web. Interesting, Mike. You've made the comment uh, about how this technology is evolving, and it truly is evolving. Can you offer any insight on where this technology will go in the future? Uh, well, that's a discussion definitely outside the scope of uh, a, a 10 to 20 minute podcast. Sure. Um, however, I will say that as someone that has had a front row seat to the impact that the internet had on global e-commerce in the early, early 90s, um, I truly believe that DLT or distributed ledger technology will, ha will be an equally transformative technology. Um, I think in speculating about the future of the technology, um, it's important for your listeners to understand some of the basic building blocks of this technology. Sure. Um, and what I'd like to do is just do a little bit of a deep dive into these components because I think this will really be important to the listeners when they begin to read about this technology to begin to delineate. So one of the first um, one of the first important components of blockchain or distributed le ledger technology is the concept of the ledger, which is nothing more than a list of accounts and as and assets associated with each with each account. However, unlike traditional spreadsheets or databases where there is an ability to read, write, rewrite, and delete data entries, blockchain and distributed ledger technologies are limited to simply write and read functionality. It is this inability of a user to rewrite or delete an entry in the ledger that forms the basis of the immutable nature of the technology. So again, that's one of the most uh, important building blocks. Yes. Um, the next, the next concept um, is the concept of blocks. <laughs> the importance of blocks in blockchain blockchain technology should be self-evident. Sure. What um, are the, what are those blocks? Because I mean, that's an important part here. Give us an idea of what we're talking about when we refer to a block. 
Sure. So blocks refer on how the transactions on the network are bundled together and recorded. Each block in the blockchain is cryptographically linked to the previous block in a manner so that any attempt to alter a transaction in a previously written block will break the cryptographical signature linking all of the previous chains together. Mm -hmm. So this this again goes to the, the concept of uh, immutability, which is very key to uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technology. Mm -hmm. So the, the next concept um, is the, the concept of a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and this is one in which the interconnected nodes share information without the use of a centralized administrator. Um, this technology was originally pop popularized by the uh, technology Napster that a lot of your intellectual property uh, listeners should be familiar sure. with. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, in blockchain or distributed ledger technology, each node on the network contains a copy, either full or a partial portion thereof, of the ledger. So again, um, this is very important to the overall functionality of the technology. Mm -hmm. um, the, the next important building block is the protocol. And the protocol is the rules of the road. And that basically is how the different nodes basically determine how the data is going to be uh, transmitted across the network and written to the ledger. The two uh, most popular protocols that uh, your listeners may be familiar with are Bitcoin and Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, another important building block with the uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technology is uh, uh, cryptographic um, and cryptography is a set of mathematical operations that allows parties to exchange encrypted or scrambled data in an open and unsecure network without the fear of the underlying data being intercepted or decrypted by a third party. Um, and, and it's important to note here um, – a lot of these uh, individual components that I am talking about here yes. have actually existed. Um, and it's kind of the beauty of the white paper um, where these existing technologies were kind of assembled and put together to, if you will, create this concept of blockchain. And one of the most, uh, if you will, the, the secret ingredient and one that tends to get a lot of discussion is the, the, this concept of consensus. Um, so consensus is the mechanism by which the network reaches agreement on the state of the ledger. Um, this is a critically important component uh, in blockchain and distributed ledger technology to economically incentivize all participants in the network to do the right thing. Because without being able to reach agreement on the state of the data in the, in the ledger, subsequent blocks of data would not be able to be added in a reliable manner. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and this is, uh, a lot of people have probably heard about this um, the original and most popular consensus mechanisms that power both the Bitcoin and the Ethereum protocols is called proof of work. Um, however, this consensus mechanism is not very eco-friendly due to the high energy consumption required. Um, this has actually led to the development of other consensus mechanisms such as proof of stake and proof of authority that provide for a quicker and less energy dependent solution to the problem. So, so the those are the kind of, yeah, those are the important building blocks. And mm -hmm. when, when one of your readers is reading an article, you would kind of want to focus on those concepts and how the author or new innovation regarding that technology treats one of these building blocks because that's where a lot of the pivots and innovation is taking place. That's helpful to know. I mean, some of this can get, you know, to me, very, very complex. And how, how do you stay on top of all this? Is this something that's developing like daily or weekly? What Give me an idea of, of where this is going. Uh, 
drinking from a fire hydrant is the best <laughs> way to, to, to put it. Um, and, and I think uh, some of your listeners, uh, for those that may want to go to the PTO database, um, and just uh, in the preambles uh, or in uh, the preambles or some of the uh, subject matter descriptions, just put in blockchain and basically do that over the last three to five years. And you can see how five years ago there was probably uh, few, if any, references to blockchain mm-hmm. um, and how that has just exploded. Um, and you now see uh, that the Chinese have actually been very prolific um, in their uh, patent uh, their patent portfolio um, regarding blockchain and distributed ledger technology. So this is uh, something that has been very uh, aggressively followed, I would say, in Europe um, and particularly in the Asia markets. Interesting. Mike, you previously stated that blockchain and distributed ledger technology would be what they call transformative. What areas do you see being most impacted by this? Uh, I believe that every area of commerce will be in, impacted, but the ones that I see the most immediate and greatest um, impact are, are, are the following. Um, supply chain management, um, financial services slash fintech, um, and then digital identity. Those are the three that I, I see the most um, immediate promise um, for, if you will, breaking existing paradigms and uh, uh, business models. For sure. And with respect to IP, since this is IP Fridays, what impact do you see this technology having on intellectual property? Um, I, I personally, it, it's interesting how you uh, tee that up. Sure. I, I personally think that the this impact will be greater or equal to the inter- impact that the internet had on the practice of intellectual property law wow. in in the late 90s. Mm-hmm. So um, I do believe um, this is uh, intellectual property attorneys will have no choice but to understand the impact of this technology. Um, because I do believe it will be that uh, transformative. Um, Earlier this year, I was at the uh, Consensus Conference in New York where there was over uh, 8,000 people attended um, the world's largest blockchain distributed ledger conference. Um, And during this uh, particular multi-day event, there actually were several sessions that were uh, dedicated to intellectual property uh, management. I believe that the integration of blockchain and distributed ledger technology into the supply chain will probably have um, much broader IP implications. There already are a number of pilots involving the healthcare sector in which they are trying to track the provenance of pharmaceuticals to eliminate counterfeit drugs that are literally killing people. So if you can track counterfeit pharmaceuticals, you can probably equally use this technology to track counterfeit designer and other high-end goods. So I believe it is that um, cradle to grave, or uh, if you will, from design to manufacture to consumer, the ability to trace um, goods um, that really hold the the most interesting impact um, uh, on behalf of uh, intellectual uh, property owners and uh, IP attorneys. Mike, this has been truly fascinating. I really appreciate you taking the time today uh, for speaking with us on IP Fridays. Thank you very much for having me, Ken. That's it for this episode. If you liked what you heard, please show us your love by visiting ipfridays.com slash love and tweet a link to this show. We would be so grateful if you would do that. It would help us out to get the word out. Also, please subscribe to our podcast at IPFridays.com or on iTunes or Stitcher.com. If you have a question or want to be featured in one of the upcoming episodes, please send us your feedback at IPFridays.com slash feedback. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes. You can go to IPFridays.com slash iTunes and it will take you right to the correct page on iTunes. If you want to get mentioned on this podcast or even have comments within the next episode, please leave us your voicemail at ipfridays.com voicemail. 
You have been listening to an episode of IP Fridays. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of nor are they endorsed by their respective law firms. None of the content should be considered legal advice. The IP Fridays podcast should not be construed as legal advice or legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only, and you are urged to consult your own lawyer on any specific legal questions. As always, consult a lawyer or patent or trademark attorney. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved.